Well, I didn't want to bore everybody with desoldering everything back apart again to find out what's shorted. But here's what I've come up with. Once I disconnected the low voltage supply, the 32 volts for the IC circuit, for the preamp circuit, um, we got our light bulb back off again. And so now I can check, and here's what I know. In low power mode, about 188 volts on the high voltage, uh, on, the, on the volt, the B plus windings of the transformer. In high voltage, we're seeing about 282 volts there. Um, I checked the heater supply. It's running over 6 volts. And it appears that our 32 volts out of the transformer is fine too. But it looks like when it got hooked up wrong, it may have uh, ruined the diodes or shorted something in the low voltage circuit. And I'm truly hoping it didn't ruin any of the ICs and that none of them were shorted. Because if we have ruined ICs, I'm pretty sure we can't buy these anymore. But we just have a problem with the uh, uh, power board over here. So I'm going to have to check all the diodes and capacitors in it and see if I can figure out what's wrong. It's going to be a few minutes while I power this thing down and drain everything. And then I'll be back. All right. What we're going to do now is use my uh, handy dandy uh, microprocessor capacitance meter and check the capacitors on the uh, power supply for the preamp, the plus minus 16 volts. Because something is shorted and I talked to the owner of the amp a few minutes ago and it was working and then it started making some like crackling noises and that for a while. Then eventually the power transformer went out. There are two big things that can cause that. One, of course, is output tubes. Although usually output tubes will blow a fuse because they draw so much current when they start to short. The other thing that will do it are capacitors going bad. So I suspect that one of these two capacitors, uh, these are the two capacitors that create the voltage from the 32 volts that help uh, with two Zener diodes to split it into a double 16 power supply plus minus for the uh, preamp. Uh, the newer amps use a center tap plus minus. Uh, this one does not. It splits it with capacitors and with the inner diodes. So let's turn on the capacitor checker and see what we have. The capacitors are marked 160 microfarads. And the bottom one tests at 160 microfarads. Let's check the top one. And we're not getting any reading from the top one. And as I said earlier, I narrowed down the short to being in this 30 volt uh, power supply or the 30 volt tap of the transformer. So I think we're onto something here. I'm going to go look for a capacitor, probably see if I have two of them. Because they are kind of matched, if one is gone, there's a possibility the second one's going to go. And again, this could be what ruined the other transformer too. Okay, we're back. We found a couple of uh, matching capacitors. They're 100 microfarad 50 volt. I look at the difference in size. This is what happens uh, in uh, almost 50 years. All right, um, what we're gonna do is I already cut one side. We're going to cut these capacitors out with, really, with a really long lead. And we're going to mechanically twist everything together if the leads are long enough. And install the new capacitors without pulling that whole board out. There's mm -hmm. just no reason to do that if we do not need to. I'm marking the plus side in case because of making this video I get distracted. It's a whole different ballgame making videos and working on stuff than it is just working on stuff. Yeah, this will work very nicely and we can make a good secure mechanical connection as well as of course electrical connection. And if we have to take out the board we will. I am from the school that as long as it's a sound repair um, and good mechanically that there's no reason to take things apart. We don't need to. 
Will this work? Yes, it will work fantastically. So what we're going to do is get a nice, get this ready to twist it hard. For right now, just get a loop around there and get a loop around this end. There we go. And we will clamp that around there nicely. And we're going to, uh, I'm going to uh, actually uh, put these two together with heat shrink or something to try to keep them from bouncing around too much. For a long time in my real job, I trained and helped out the electrical repair people in the Chrysler assembly plants. And when you see what engineers do to make car wiring stay in one piece, you kind of learn that you want your repairs to be very mechanically sound. Combo apps, of course, are generally the worst because they, in all operating conditions, they're getting vibrated very large amount. Not a whole lot different than a car going down the road. We're going to solder those up. We are going to get to pull the board because that one pulled out of the board and that's that. So I'm going to uh, pull the board and solder that one back down inside. Be very careful of all these welder wires attached. This will take very little heat to do this. Yay. Yay. Hell, I'm tired when I start saying yay. Okay, real good. Let's uh, secure these capacitors and prevent them from vibrating. I think we'll use a little bit of a Gorilla Glue here. Okay, so we're going to solder the low voltage wires in. So we just have to connect this one back up and we'll see how she does drawn current. Okay. Yep, both of our high voltage wires are just hanging loose. Um, but we're going to put this into standby so there's no high voltage anyway. At least pass the standby switch. And then we're going to plug it in and turn it on and see whether it is still shorted. And this is a big yay. We have a pilot light on and the, the limiter did not light up at all, which one would expect with very little current drop. So we're going to check the voltage going to the preamp quickly. I don't have to worry about the high voltage. It's all over here. I'm not getting near it. Yep, that's it. Looks like we're in good shape. Uh, it's nominally 16, but we have plus 17 volts here and minus 17 volts here. I think this thing's going to work when we finish putting it together. Now what I have to do is disconnect the power, turn off the switch, disconnect the power, and the only thing that should have any power in it is the low voltage part of this, but just to be safe, I'm going to drain the capacitors. Yeah, I'll drain off that. Like I said, it's only, only 30 volts, but I'll drain it down just because it's good practice. And for the heck of it, I'll hit B+, plus, but there's nothing there anyway. It hasn't been connected. 
there. We're all good. Okay, let's verify that this is, yeah, it's a good solder joint. Okay, to the best of my knowledge, let's do a triple check here. Everything is hooked up, but we're at a point right now, um, I'm going to put tubes in it. And the reason for that is, is that this, I don't know how many, how long this thing hasn't worked. But it does mean that it's high voltage capacitors haven't had voltage on them for a while. Um, but I'm going to put some output tubes in it because without output tubes, it's going to peak out at maximum voltage. I'll put an output tubes and let it warm up before I take it out of standby. I'm going to grab some tubes. This amp is not plugged in right now. Now we have to be careful that I don't break the tubes by hitting them on the workbench. I'm going to connect my negative side of my digital multimeter to uh, ground. And we're going to turn it on and see what happens. The limiter bulb lit up a bit, as it should, because of the, heat, the cold heaters on the EL34s, and it's getting dim. So far, so good. Yeah, when Leo Fender put the company together to make these amps, the goal always was to make amps as clean as possible. And I don't know if there are, except for some solid states, I don't know if there are very many amps out there that run tubes that are as clean as these things are. They were really popular back in the days. I actually was playing back in those days and um, really liked them. I was a, I had a Fender Bandmaster that I got almost new in 68 and uh, then I got a 73 Ampeg VT22 with a V4 bottom from a guy I had played in bands with before. He gave me a great deal on it and I had that for many, many years. I loved that amp. The people who carried it and set it up for me didn't like it so well. Okay. Beautiful. Our voltage is right just under 17 volts, plus and minus, which is good for that. Let's check the bias voltage. Minus 23. I'm going to set the bias as cold as it goes for a few minutes here. That brought the bias to minus 32. That's cold. As a matter of fact, I'm not for an EL34. I don't even know if it'll make noise at that bias. Although the voltage on the plates may be very high here. I'm going to shut it off momentarily while I flip this into high voltage. Uh, I don't like the, uh, there's nothing charged in here yet. Hey, look at that. I magically changed my hair, my shirt, and it's actually a couple of days later. Um, it was Easter and I had to uh, go out and catch some muskrats so we had something for Easter dinner. But in the meantime, I haven't been running the camera for some of the work on this amplifier. After I replaced the capacitors for the low voltage section, that is the plus minus 16 for the integrated circuit preamp, I could not get high voltage out of the high voltage uh, section to be at the readings that was supposed to. Furthermore, uh, during the testing, it went out completely, shorted out. So one of the challenges when you work on an amplifier that other people have already worked on is that sometimes they may have done things incorrectly, in this case even left parts out. Whoever serviced this last wasn't familiar with how it was supposed to work. And a couple of things had happened. The biggest one is, is that one of the resistors, it had two 150K 2 watt resistors here. One of them was burned out. And then what the other, these things are jumping over. I'll show you on the other side of the chassis here without breaking the tubes off. They have, they pump these two capacitors up right here. 
Now these capacitors um, are hooked in series and off of the top end we get our 700 and some volts. Well, there was a missing capacitor on the other side. And then what it did is it overloaded a diode and then burnt this diode out too. So, I decided to go off camera because it took a really long time. I've got a lot of hours into this. And I went through the entire schematic uh, for the power supply section and I reconnected everything correctly. I put new capacitors in it and that's where we're at right now. And what I'm going to do in a minute is uh, fire this up and we're going to see what happens. I think everything should be in pretty good shape. I've got everything ready to go for our testing here. Uh, the amp, I've, I've also uh, got this, uh, I'm not going to reach in there right now because it is plugged in. Let me find something here. This is the bias wire that provides bias to the output tubes. Um, that's going to have to be moved over into a new high-low circuit right over here on the switch. But first, I'm going to leave the bias as cold as it goes, and then we're going to quickly see what our plate voltage looks like. Negative lead to the chassis of the amplifier. And as I said, uh, the voltages are very high in the music band. We don't mess around one hand in there at a time. Um, I'm sitting on rubber mats for whatever that's worth. And let's give it a try. First thing I'll do is turn on the power, the switches in standby. Remember, when we change this from the old style transformer to the new, the front switch used to be power low and high, now it's standby low and high, and the power switch is moved to the back. Okay, power lights on, nothing's drawing too much current. We have 16, I'll move that in there. We have just under 17 volts positive there. Just a little over 17 volts negative there, all a good sign. It means that our preamp circuit's getting the voltage it's supposed to. Now let's check our plate voltage. First of all, going to the output transformer, let's check that voltage first. Um, it should be zero, it's in standby right now. That's got about half a volt just from, it, just from whatever. So let's put it in low power mode first. Yay, no sparks. And the voltage is set at. We've got 535 right now on low power going to the output transformer and we'll put it up in high power and in high power we have yikes 777 volts that's monster this is not the kind of voltage even if the humidity is high I would not recommend getting my hand little finger or anything close to that high voltage area there let's check the plate voltage on the tubes now We've got 775 on one tube and 775 on the other tube for our plate voltages. Screen. The screens are tied together in this amp instead of having separate resistors. They're at 385 right now. So, very good. What we're going to do next is we're going to hook up a signal uh, the oscilloscope and uh, set the bias and then find out what we end up with the plate voltages. So far, so good. I'm going to put the amp in standby, however, it's still pretty hot in there, probably. Pretty high voltages. Turn the scope on. Now, when you're testing an amplifier uh, with the scope, usually you want your bright switch off, mid all the way up if it has a mid control, and the other tones all the way down, and that, that gives you the most, that's the flattest setting on most Fender style tone stack amps. Actually, Marshall's pretty much too. Okay, so the goal now is to see whether this actually puts out any sound. I'm going to turn the tone generator on. It's set to about, easily like it a little over 1K. Um, it's just a preference for the width of the wave. And let's see what happens here. Um, we'll turn the master volume up about to 6. We'll go into low power first. Nothing's really happening there. Um, it might be because the bias is so cold right now with the low voltage, it's just not reproducing any signal. Let's put it up into high power and try it. There we go. 
Okay, I'm going to bring the master all the way up to 10, and then we will take the volume up until we just start to peak out. And we have a significant crossover notch in this thing. So that means the bias is indeed too cold. So we're going to start warming the bias up to try to get rid of that crossover notch. It's almost gone there. It's pretty much gone there. Oh. I'm going to take my scope down one level. There. And there's just about no crossover notch right there until we start distorting, and that's that's normal. So that probably looks my that looks pretty good for bias right there. Let's see if the low works now. Yeah, see it's working a bit. Can you see that? But tremendous crossover notch. That's because we're running a lot lower plate voltage, so the bias voltage has to be correspondingly or proportionally lower. Let's just see for the heck of it what we're running at idle for a plate voltage right now with the bias setup on this thing. Seven hundred and forty-four on one tube, seven forty-four on the other tube. So it's well balanced. Um, it's a very reasonable plate voltage for this amplifier. It's, it's pretty incredible actually that it runs this high of plates on EL34s, but remember it's a voltage doubling circuit producing this. So when it starts, if anything goes with these tubes where they overconduct, it draws the power supply right down. Uh, voltage doubling circuits can't handle a lot of current, so they kind of self-protect the tubes. Um, I don't think you'd want to run this much plate voltage on a EL34 if it was all power transformer based. If I would have left this camera running for all the diagnosis time on this, um, it would have been, uh, probably had to have been a mini-series. Uh, it looks like we got it. The high voltage is working perfectly. The voltages are in the range they're supposed to be. Um, it's producing, uh, we'll do a final power output check after I finish the bias circuit for this. So what we're going to do now is put it in standby, take the power off, and then uh, start unplugging everything. And then we're going to very carefully drain the high voltage supply out of this. However, the way the supply is actually put together, it's supposed to be self-draining. Let's check. Yes, it's already brought its, itself down to it's bouncing around a little because of the way capacitors work, but it's down in the 2 or 3 volt range already. And the plate voltage is down to 6 volts. It's jumpered by these, the capacitors are already jumped by a 150K resistor. So basically within 10 seconds or so, this should be pretty much drained out. Yeah, it's down to 4 volts. Uh, there's no 4 volts on the plates. Uh, the, the power supply for the preamp is down to half a volt. So I'm not going to drain the caps in it. Everything drained itself. Uh, in a well-designed amp, they should drain themselves. And so what, we're, what I'm going to do now is unplug it and I'm going to wire up the adjustable uh, bias circuit. So hopefully we got high power working, low power will work. And if everything goes okay, this thing will finally be back to its owner.
Okay, we're going to test this thing now and I'm going to plug it into a current limiter in case I messed up the bias circuit so we don't hurt the output tubes. Like I said, then we'll clean up all the wiring and tie wrap it and so forth. There's no voltage going up to this part of the amp right now. So the next thing I'm going to do is see how the bias looks on both settings. Let's try high. Now you can see the top of the waves cut off pretty badly. That's because it's still in the series current limiter. Let's try low. Yay, it looks almost the same. Looks like our bias is right in range. Woohoo. I'm going to uh, put it in standby and switch out of the current limiting position up there into a regular full power feed. Let's give her a try. In low power, no crossover notch. And into 4 ohms, right there we're producing a little over 10 volts. So it's a nice clean wave, which is good news that all of the bad wiring that was done in here didn't seem to screw up any of the uh, preamp. And that's really good because these parts are probably very difficult or impossible to find. So right now we're producing, it's 10 point, uh, I'm getting 10.5 volts, 10.5 squared divided by, it's in 4 ohms right now. It's producing about 20, just under 28 watts uh, RMS, close to RMS in low power mode. Let's switch it to high and see what it's producing. Okay, that's about it right there. It's 15.4. 15.4 volts squared divided by 4. It's producing 59.3 uh, watts. So just, on, just about 60 watts. It's doing what it's supposed to now. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is do the regular maintenance on the amp. After I tie wrap all of the wires back together, make it look nice and neat and everything. And while it's draining, unplug the speaker. Well, I'll tell you what, the quality of the jacks, I'm sure they're, I'm guessing they're switchcraft, but what good jacks this thing. You know, you see certain things that are built so gorgeously. Really nice capacitors. They did a nice job on these amps. They're pretty sought after and I can see why. Um, like I said, working on them is quite a bit different than most other amps. Some people are uncomfortable with the solid state preamp. Uh, in some of these, as I said, the 12AX7 actually is kind of like an overdrive tube. And in some of them, like these early ones, it's actually a regular driver for the EL34s. Some of you can switch tubes. I don't think I would put a 6L6 into an amp with uh, 750 volts or so on the plates. Maybe it would be okay, but these are customers' amps, so I'm not going to do it. Let's see what we're down to. About 7 volts on the B+, plus, 5 on the screens, and half a volt on the low voltage circuit. This thing is safe to work on, it's unplugged, and as I said, the next first thing I'm going to do is tie wrap everything back together in here, make sure the switch is tight, and uh, then I'll do the regular maintenance on the amp, and then woohoo, we get to play with it. All right, it's time to try it out with the guitar. Starting off in what's called the normal channel, we'll put it in low power. This thing's actually, <laughs> master's turned to seven, the volume's turned to between zero and one. It, this thing is so incredibly loud, it's outrageous. And as I said, we're in low power right now. Just incredible.
absolutely incredibly clean and if you want a little distortion out of it, I'm not sure I like it real well, but turn the master down, bring the volume up to about six and a half. And this is in the single coil mode, so the output's low from the guitar. <laughs> Pretty fuzzy. We take it down a little bit. So I just get a bite on it, about two and a half on the volume. The guitar starts to get a little bit of a bite, a little crunchy. Not playing too well, but purpose. I'm working on the amp. It's freezing down here. The amp shop is uh, 45 feet underground. It's a constant, uh, like 52 degrees. Now we'll flip it up into high power mode. I hope it comes through on the mic. It's as clean as clean can be. It's really a nice sounding app if you're looking for clean. This thing would be fantastic uh, with uh, an Echoplex in front of it or something. Anyway, this has been a long journey. Not too much money per hour made on this one. But it's back together. It's in its former glory. And it always feels really fantastic to get one of these worked on. The main lead with is, I don't recommend as a beginner you start working on a Music Man for your first few amps unless you want to be really frustrated. Or unless you have really good understanding of voltage doubler circuits and how to test and diagnose integrated uh, circuits. And in these, the main thing is there are uh, three power supplies. The IC power supply, the uh, bias supply, and then a two-level high voltage supply that's very unusual. Thanks so much, and uh, I guess stay healthy, huh?